And then it got to the point where it's okay, well, now that I've flown first class, I don't ever want to sit economy again. You actually might not be treated as well if they're like, well, he spends a lot of money with us, but he's also spending half of his wallet on American Airlines or Delta. So maybe we should treat him like a little bit better so we get more of that like percent of wallet spent. Like most of you guys, I'm sure you've run across situations where you're in the same city as someone you actually want to meet up with, but you find out a little too late, then you would have rather have met up with them if you had the chance. These are all of my contacts I personally know. Now, if I remove my contacts, these are all the users that are active, so. Hey there, points people. You just heard a clip from Eric Creekmore, founder of the There app, spelled T-H-R. Eric is a former college athlete turned entrepreneur. He expanded a financial firm before embracing minimalism and travel in 2021. He developed the There app, which aims to transcend digital communication barriers and foster authentic connections for professionals, digital nomads, and socialites. In this episode, expect to hear about why Eric even developed the There app in the first place, challenges you might face during full-time travel, how the There app works to connect travelers, and so much more. And if you would like to meet some fellow Points and Miles friends at our next meetup, join us in Washington, D.C. on July 13. Check out the show notes for details and the link to register. Before downloading the There app in preparation for your next trip, you may want to increase your points bank to help cover the cost of your next flight or hotel. One card to consider is the Chase Sapphire Preferred. This card has points that transfer to many different airlines. And it's often a top card recommended for beginners in points and miles. Remember, if you decide to apply for the Chase Sapphire Preferred or any other card, never apply directly through Google. Always use a friend or creator's referral link. And if you are interested in supporting this show when you apply for your next card, check out geobreezetravel.com slash cards. And if you're not sure what card is right for you, I offer free credit card consultations at geobreezetravel.com slash consultations. And we have links to the Chase Sapphire Preferred card and the free consultation form for you in the show notes as well. And now, on with the show! Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina-American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. If you're dreaming of your next getaway, but worried about the cost, then you might want to check out Thrifty Traveler. With their subscription mailing list, you will get dozens of flight deals delivered straight to your inbox every week. They've sent out deals like Thanksgiving flights to Italy for $400 off, Delta One Suites to South Korea for 106,000 points instead of the usual 300,000 points, and Q Suites business class seats to the Maldives or Southeast Asia for only 95,000 points instead of the usual $4,000 per ticket. Just imagine how much more vacation you can get when you save that much on your flights. Sign up today at thriftytraveler.com and use the code GEO10. That's G-E-O-1-0 to save $10 off of the annual subscription. Thank you to Thrifty Traveler for partnering with this episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, Eric. Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you. I'm excited to talk about all of your tips for frequent flyers because you fly a lot. And also to talk about your app, which I think a lot of people in the community will be really interested in downloading and checking out and testing out and learning more about. But before we get into all of that, tell us a little bit about you and your background and how did you get into the world of travel and app development? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. My background is in insurance sales. Pretty much after college, I got into sales and that developed into insurance sales, which was a very transient industry in general. As far as travel, there's always conferences. My first big trip was an incentive trip. So that just kind of got me 
introduced into traveling outside of the United States, which growing up, we just stayed within the U.S. for the most part. So as I started being exposed to the Mexicos, the Hawaii's, which are longer trips than I was used to, I became more work centric where I was going to conferences and then maybe going to open up new offices and now I have partners. And so it had me on the road quite a bit and I quite honestly loved it. And it always kept things fresh and also developed a lot of great relationships, very diverse relationships from being on the road so much as well. That was kind of early in my career. And then towards the most recent, probably when COVID hit. Obviously, most of us went remote, which kind of forced our industry to finally go remote, (laughs) which most of what we do can be done remote anyway. So it made it a lot more efficient. During this time, I had also decided when I was living in Fort Lauderdale to literally sell all of my material belongings, everything besides like an old hot rod. I went down to three suitcases, got rid of my place, my car, everything, and traveled. And that was a little bit of me almost semi-retiring, I guess. And then, yeah, so I I started this world tour for a couple of years and started traveling. So that's, that's kind of how I got into being on the road a lot, really trying to understand points and miles and racking up status. COVID definitely had a, a lot of great perks and ways they were trying to keep our business. So I was able to skip a couple levels, if you will, and maintain them since then. What was your go-to airline status and hotel status while you were traveling a lot for work? I think originally I had, I was a big Delta guy. And I think this was before I really started traveling because Delta being in Florida, having Atlanta as, as their home base, would always have a layover. And I just didn't know any better. I was always just used to layovers. And then as I start traveling more, I'm like, man, this this layover stuff's not fun. So I started going really just based off of time and route, if you will, over and price, obviously, as I was coming up in the travel world, if you will. And then it got to the point where it's okay, well, now that I've flown first class, I don't ever want to sit economy again. So now it became what's the cheapest first class ticket I can get that's direct. And then as I started getting into having the Amex Platinum and a couple of the airline cards, I would get baseline status. So then I would just be a matter of just hitting my minimums, if you will, to keep my status or to get to the next uh, level on pretty much most airlines. I'm not as loyal as I probably should be to one airline, I would say, but more so I've got status down. I've been able to maintain status with American, United, Delta, and then obviously hotels. <clears throat> the main ones for me is, is Bonvoy and then Hyatt for the most part. And then Hilton I've got status with. But being an ambassador with Bonvoy pretty much gives me very free reign to do whatever I want, wherever I want with them. And then Globalist with Hyatt, they had a like a thing during COVID where literally it was like half the qualifications to get globalist. So I've just always hit my minimum with Marriott to keep my status. And then I start shifting over to Hyatt and just Hilton would be like third. Yeah. What's the strategy behind splitting status instead of being like, I'm already ambassador with Marriott, might as well go fill in on that. Or I'm already globalist with Hyatt, might as well just get Hyatt all the time, why I maintain multiple statuses, especially with airlines, because with airlines, if you have top tier with one, you can kind of just get upgraded all the time instead of having like level two or three status with multiples. What's the strategy there? I don't know that there is necessarily a strategy because again, I'm more going to the travel summit was probably my most exposure I've had other than a few talks here and there, watching some Instagram reels. With the hotels, I'll just say just out of the gate, it's It's more so just preference of hotel. And I feel like Marriott, for the most part in the States, has the most options for the type of hotel I like. Whereas Hyatt in the Caribbean, Mexico, things like that, they've got some really great properties. Hilton has their select, like maybe Waldorf would be the only one that's really consistent with four and five star hotels. So I think it's just, for me, it's always been like, where can I get the most bang for my buck? Could I do better and use people like yourself more to like know how to 
leverage points better a hundred percent. And that's definitely what I'm trying to get better at and have people around me that can help guide me as well. I think when you're traveling as much as you are though, it makes sense to have multiple statuses because I travel quite a bit. I would prefer Hyatt Globalist everywhere, but Hyatt just has such a small footprint. So Marriott is my secondary and I'm generally hitting titanium status there. And something else we learned at the travel summit was airlines have this profile on you of like your share of wallet and how much of the pie chart do they take up. And so if United's like, well, he's going to fly with us no matter what. So here we are. You actually might not be treated as well if they're like, well, he spends a lot of money with us, but he's also spending half of his wallet on American Airlines or Delta. So maybe we should treat him like a little bit better. So we get more of that like percent of wallet spent. So I don't know how they're tracking all of that. And if they're like sharing data between Delta and United and American and all of those so that they can figure out what percent of the pie chart of your wallet they're taking up. But if if that's a real thing, which I assume it is because there's so much data collection going on, pitting these companies against each other to be like, who's going to treat me better? Who's going to give me better upgrades? I've got more wallet to spend. It's not a bad strategy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure there is something out there. I think another thing as you're talking through it, I'm 6'4 and not a, a small guy. So <laughs> I don't really like to gamble with anything that's under two hours that I'm going to get upgraded on first class. So I'm willing to pay whether it's dollars or miles on a first class ticket. So I think it just comes down to, again, back to price. Like as long as I have a uh, first class seat and access to some booze and maybe a meal, like I'm good with it. I don't need to take the gamble on if I'm going to get upgraded or not. Makes sense. So at the point where you semi-retired and then you went and consolidated your life into three suitcases, where did you travel to after that? Yeah. So the first stop was Greece. I'd never been to Greece at the time. I was dating a girl that. She had never been, so we started in Athens and then hit the islands, Mykonos, Santorini. Spent, I think, about four, yeah, almost a month out there. And then from there, we hopped over to Spain. So we did Madrid. We popped over, obviously, to Barcelona, did Marbella. Just basically, that was more so I had already been just relaxing a little bit after after Mykonos and stuff. But... From there, this was like actually my first real international, in my head, travel hack. And I was using Skiplag for an international flight. And this is during COVID too. So it was actually to try to get back over to North America because of the time difference was just a lot to keep up with my business because I hadn't officially decided like, hey, I'm done with this. I'm going to move on to the app. I'm still trying to run my insurance business, which was hard to do with a seven to nine hour time difference so anyway long story short i had booked this trip from i believe it was madrid i was in barcelona and so i had to get it from barcelona to madrid and then madrid to mexico city on air mexico and or mexico air however you say it but anyway but it was the final destination was cartagena and colombia so at the time there were all these different COVID custom type of forms and different requirements. And then they had to verify that you had a, it was a one-way ticket. They had to verify your hotel. So I really, and then we also had carry-ons that were, they're real carry-ons, but in on the little puddle jumper, the Ryan Airs or whatever to get from Barcelona to Madrid, they were considered checked luggage. So we had to talk them into somehow Spitting our spitting our luggage out, having to go get it before we get on our other flight. Then we get to the gate and show us your hotel in Colombia. We weren't going to Colombia. We we're going to Mexico City, and this was a difference of fare of I think it was like seven eight hundred dollars total for a first class fare on Air Mexico from Madrid to Mexico City, with obviously the end in Cartagena versus a direct to anywhere in the U.S like four thousand dollars so four thousand euro actually so it was a huge deal and it was a big gamble obviously and i was paying for my girlfriend so this double that and yeah we made it was nice and sweaty and we got there and so from mexico we ended up um, doing a lot of actually the, the national parks spending a ton of time in california 
me being from Florida, I've always just, when I go to California, I'm going to LA, maybe make it to the beach, but never have really done Pacific Coast Highway. And so I spent a month there. Then I went to Bali with a group of friends. We were there for about a month and I loved it so much. I went back and during this Bali trip, we had done Singapore, skips my mind right now. But anyway, so I loved Bali so much and I wanted to make sure that I loved it for the for it being Bali, not because I went with a great group of friends, right? So I literally 30 days after I got back in the States, I went back to Bali by myself for New Year's, right after like literally Christmas night, I left and went to Bali again, spent three weeks there by myself, saw some amazing concerts, met a, a lot of cool people and reconnected with people I met the first time. And I was gonna buy a place there, honestly. And then I just decided with the rain, the way it is not very predictable that I don't know that I would be able to sustain living there. But then I come to find out like it's rainy season. So I wouldn't necessarily live there during rainy season. From there, went to Australia, spent like three weeks there. So yeah, and then after that, stopped in Hawaii for I think about a month. And then there's some trips here and there. But during that time was like really... I think for me, I, I realized I don't like to be like, I don't like to be alone, but I like to not be at home, if that makes sense. Like, I, I always want to be traveling, but I would like to be able to travel with someone or at least be able to connect with people in those areas that I'm in because it kind of gets lonely when you're like by yourself. And obviously, you're in a beautiful area, you can find things to do, but it does get lonely, if that makes sense. That absolutely makes sense. And I hear that from a lot of digital nomads who are like, yeah, I'm kind of on my own and it feels very transient. You're making new friends all over the place. If you're at a hostel or you're there for a conference, you're always constantly having to just meet new people and always be on. And it, it does feel very lonely oftentimes, especially if you're also working during the day, whether it's working remotely, developing your own thing, or you're just kind of closed in in your Airbnb. I hear that a lot. So throughout this trip, at what point did you decide you don't want to run an insurance business anymore? So it's not that I didn't want to run the insurance business. It's that I didn't want to be in the day-to-day. -day. So like <clears throat> I've built, for the most part, our entire sales infrastructure. So I've been in sales for a very long time. And that led into leadership development, which I convert good salespeople into good sales trainers and then leaders of companies. So it's very emotionally taxing. It's very challenging in the fact that there is definitely a reward at the very end when you see someone become financially free or you see them become this amazing leader that you know that you had a lot to do with that. But the reward is so strung out. Like I'm talking some people, it's a decade of really hard conversations, a lot of accountability, financial issues, lots of emotional issues like that I have to deal with, but just because it's part of the business. So I think it just more so I was burnt out on the day-to-day. -day. I'm still really good at what I do. I could still hold coaching calls. I could still work with specific people, but brand new people in the industry, brand new people selling their own business for the first time. It's just the amount of effort and energy it takes to build someone up to where they're somewhat self-sustainable was just kind of where I was just like, there's got to be a better way at this point now that I have the means to invest in something that isn't so labor intensive, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So were you already developing the app and where did the idea kind of come up with for what you were going to build? Yeah. So just for context here, I, like most of you guys, I'm sure you've run across situations where you're in the same city as someone you actually want to meet up with, but you find out a little too late that they were there on Instagram or Facebook or that they shot you a text. And you would have rather have met up with them if you had the chance. So I, I actually, this problem came about prior to COVID with me traveling so much for work and still trying to not make it work where it's like, hey, if I'm going to be going to Scottsdale to go hiking, 
which one of my partners are going to be in town or which agents are going to be there that I can meet up with. And it was just this big conundrum of texting who's where, who's going to be there, what dates, are they free? It was just a lot of work and it just felt very inefficient. So the idea was actually spawned prior to COVID, but when I actually decided to pull the trigger was right before I went on my trip, well, my retirement trip, I guess, like in 2021, I had decided that I was going to go on this trip. I knew this was something I wanted to find a solution to, and there was no one out there solving it. So I decided, I guess more so like looking back on like my father had a bunch of ideas. He had them all written in his black book growing up and he never did one of them. And I'm sure he regrets it. And I definitely think about that a lot of, I don't want to be 50, 60, 70 years old and have this book of ideas or what ifs, if you will. So I just pulled the trigger on. I was like, it was very spontaneous. And this app developer came along and was like, we can do it for you. It's going to cost you roughly 50 grand and it's going to take three to six months tops. Well, fast forward, we're two and a half years in and we're three quarters of a million dollars into it. So I wish it was that simple. I have no tech background. So obviously a lot of expensive mistakes happened along the way. And now we've got an official go to market on the app, like fully functioning app that really takes the friction out of knowing when you're going to be in the same city on overlapping dates as people that you actually want to meet up with. Yeah. If you want to pull up a demo, this sounds really interesting where we can kind of walk through how this exactly works, because I'm sure people listening have a lot of different questions. Like how do you designate who you want to know that you're in town? Because I hope I don't have any creepy stalkers from the internet, but if I, I don't want them to know when I'm in their city, but if it's somebody where I met them at a conference or something, I would love to meet up with them. How do you designate who's allowed to see your status? Because a lot of Instagram people, especially women, we are just trained to post after we've already left a city or after we've left a hotel because you just hear nightmares. So if somebody shows up at your hotel and they're like, I figured out what hotel you were staying in while you were in this foreign country. And I'm like, I'm going to get murdered. I'm going to get murdered. So how does that all work with your app where I'm like, you people are allowed to know that I'm in town and this group of people are not allowed to know. 100%. So I, to start off with, I have a little sister. So I built this with women in mind and safety and privacy. So we don't require exact location. Actually, we don't even ask for it at all. It's all based on city. And it's as public or private as you want it to be. So you simply, when you come into the app, you upload your phone contacts. Out of those phone contacts, obviously anyone that's already a user will be added to your general network. Now, if you wanted someone to be considered your close friend, which in your situation, if you wanted to just make sure that only your really close friends, then you just designate them as a close friend. And then when your trips come in, which you link your email and it, our AI goes in and detects bookings for like hotels, airlines, rental cars, and says, hey, we detected a trip. Are these correct? And who do you want to see it? Do you want everyone in the world to see it? Do you want just people that know you to see it? Or do you want just your close friends to see it? So that's how we designate that. And then based off of that, if any of your friends are going to be in the same city, whether they live there or whether they're visiting there on overlapping dates, each of you would get notifications that ahead of time as these trips are booked that you guys will be there at the same time so you can either message each other in the app or shoot each other a text obviously because more than likely you have each other's phone numbers so that's in an essence how it works more so upload your contacts connect your email and it's kind of set it forget it a little bit and then it's just alerts and it's a good way obviously to stay in touch with i look at it like this i have three thousand contacts in my phone and as a founder I kind of had to do this manually and we're working on tech solutions to gamify this a little bit and use AI to help with sorting through those 3,000, if you were. So of the 3,000, I probably have about a thousand I actually care to ever meet up with again. And then of that thousand, there's about a hundred I keep up with, meaning if I were to go to a, a city where I was visiting, I would text them if I knew that they were either Somehow I knew that they were going to be there too. Or if I thought they lived there, I would text them, right? But it's that other 900 people 
this would be almost like you. Like I met you at a conference one time. It's like, you're interesting. You're into travel. Cool. If I'm going to be in a city that you are, maybe there's a likelihood that we meet up just because like we've met before. You're cool. It's like, there's stuff we, we have in common, but we don't necessarily keep up with each other, but it would, given the circumstances, it, it would be, yeah, sure. Of course. Right. So that other 900 people that, this app enables the connection with. So I, I can do a quick little demo, if you will. The app is called There, spelled T-H-R. It is live on the App Store. Or you can just go to the website, there-app, so thr-app.com. All right, so here's the main website. Obviously, depending on which app you, or sorry, which type of phone you have, we have Apple, Google Play, and then you can actually run this off desktop as well. So from the desktop app, really at this point, you're going into the actual app. This is what it'll look like on your desktop as well as your phone. Obviously, a little bit smaller on your phone. And here, these are all of my contacts I personally know. Now, if I remove my contacts, these are all the users that are active. So you know, right now, I'm based in Chicago. These are all people that I've actually connected with in the app that I know. So like I was mentioning prior, different ways to classify close network, general network, and public. And then you can obviously message them in here. Now, Morris doesn't have any trips. If he did, and he had me set to be able to view those certain trips, they would be listed here. We, I'm sure we'll see an example here in a second, but here's kind of the basis of the app, right? So my next trip is going to be Tampa on the 24th through the 27th. What's cool is Tampa right now is only about five people that i'm connected with look there we go so these people here i know they would have gotten an alert that i'm going to be there once i set my trip and then this also shows like where everyone else in the world is going to be on these dates as well so i could literally look and see if i decided oh well, maybe instead of tampa i'm going to go to panama city well then i obviously could see those people there as well so this is based on specific dates right where you're like hey where's everybody going to be on like 4th of July or something so if we were connected in the app and I didn't have any trips for 4th of July does it always just say I'm in Las Vegas or it just takes my bubble off of the map yep so your profile is based off of what we call our, our home base or home city right so when you're in your account setup you'll designate like for example mine's in Chicago Right. So it's just think of it like a pawn on a chessboard. So unless you move that pawn somewhere in the future and some other location, it's always going to remain in your home base. Right. So when people come to Chicago, I'll get an alert, even if I never traveled a day in my life. Obviously, Chicago is a hub. People are in and out all the time. I'll just get alerts that people are coming and going. Right. Now, once I leave, right. So during May 24th to the 27th, my icon will not be in Chicago, it'll be in Tampa. And then same for New York. During the 5th through the 8th, my icon will show in New York. Now, if you were going to be in New York on the 7th through the 10th, you would show up here because you're in my overlapping dates and you would get an alert. So if I'm normally based in Las Vegas and I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to go to Texas for the weekend, but I don't need anybody to know. It's just still going to show I'm in Las Vegas. So if somebody else comes in Las Vegas and they're like, are you in town? The app says you're in town. I would just be like, I'm actually not. I just didn't update my app. 100%. Yep. yep. That makes sense. And so this will only connect you with people who are in your contacts, right? What if you want to meet with somebody where like you were both at the same conference, you forgot to exchange numbers, but people are like, oh, I, I just want to connect with anybody else who's like in the GeoBreeze travel community or in this other mastermind I'm in. How does that work? Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do that. So you can literally just click the, the plus button, you go into your contacts, and you can literally like, James, I just met at the conference, I don't even know his last name, and then take his number, right? And then if you had his email, great. If you remember where he lived, great. If not, it doesn't matter, because as long as you have their number, then you'll be able to hit send, add contact, and then you go into James Conference, and 
from here, once you're on your phone, this won't say edit, it'll say invite, and it'll actually pull up your text on your phone and it'll text James right from there. Hey, it's Eric. I'm inviting you to my network on there. Click the link below and then it'll bring him right to the app store. It'll download it and it'll automatically connect us. All right. So now if he didn't have, if he didn't have his phone number, let's just say, then he would just need to download the app. He would need to become a user and then you could just search him as a user. Let's say you didn't want him to have your phone number. You would just search him as a user and let's, it would show if he was on a public profile, otherwise he would have to add you. And then you guys connect within the app and then you can message each other within there as well. Now, here's another way, right? So we were all at the travel summit. I built this for Prince of Travel because they threw it. Now, in the general chat here, you've got a few different people that were going back and forth. We have Rowan, Tommy. Now. I didn't have Rowan's number. He's in here. I still, I don't even know if I still have Rowan's number, but I added him in here just as a connection, as general network. So that way, if I were to ever be in Toronto, he would get an alert. Or if maybe we're going to cross paths at some point, we get an alert as well. But the cool thing is as a, as a community in here, we can all chat back and forth while we're there. But then we can also see real time where everyone in this community went afterwards and where they're going to be on our on my next trip. So if I'm just trying to stay in touch with these people, well, it looks like no one from the Travel Summit is going to be in Florida on those weeks. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So let's say that someone like me or somebody who has an online community is like, everybody join this and then like meet up with each other. Do I just build a channel and other people can join it and then meet up with each other there and I just make it public or private or how does that work if i'm just like i don't want random people stalking my people <laughs> yeah yeah no it's actually exactly what this is for think about facebook groups and slack and you know discord basically that's what this is right different communities that i'm a part of okay so i have my own community and that's kind of like the global community everyone that i am connected with and my contacts my phone obviously but then within here, I can create a whole community in itself. So if you wanted to create a community just for your followers, your Instagram followers, and just come in, create community name, your followers, what the you know purpose of the group is, and then people that you want to add that are already on the app, put your little logo in here, and that's going to create a community like one of these, right? So then from here, you can get in and you can create different channels. So the announcements, that's a one-way communication. So anyone that's in this channel as an admin, I'm the only one and you can set other admins if you wanted. It's just pushing content one way, just to your followers. Now the general channel, that's typically where all your followers can kind of collaborate and talk about whatever they want to talk about, or you can even lead the conversation if you so chose. But then you get into these private channels, right? So as part of your community, maybe there's a VIP membership that you charge for. Maybe it's $100 a month to get deals first or travel hacks that everyone doesn't. Or maybe it's just an application type of environment where it's like only whatever CEOs are allowed in this group. And I have to approve your application to be a part of this. Because obviously, to your point, like when the travel influencer world, you got a lot of followers, but you don't necessarily want to hang out with all of them or have them know where you're going to be. But I bet there's a good handful of people that in your community that you do want, right? So that's where your private communities come in and they, you want like vetted communities, right? So like I make the example of you don't want CEOs and salespeople in the same channel, but you do want CEOs and say CEOs in the same channel if that makes sense. So then this gives you another way to monetize your audience as well as provide a ton more value to your audience because right now they're watching all the cool stuff that you're doing. They're probably traveling a lot too, but they all have typically something in common, which in this case I'm assuming is travel, which now your community actually has a place to collaborate and it's not so hard to like actually meet mm -hmm. up, like DMing each other, doing a little Facebook or Zoom dates, and then it's like, oh, well, it's nice, but I live here and you live there. And it's like, hey, let me know when you're in town. And we know how that goes. That's why this was built. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think it makes it a lot easier for people to connect after different events because I've been to so many conferences where I'm like, 
I wish I could connect with that person later, but I have no idea like how to find them. And I usually just feel weird walking up to someone being like, give me your phone number or your WhatsApp after a conference. It's happened like a couple of times, but usually not. <laughs> yeah. So this hinges on you either having them as a contact in your phone or you need to know the first and last name that they're using in the app because if somebody kind of changed their name so they're more difficult to find, you're going to have a hard time finding them here, right? Yeah, if, if you don't have their phone number or their email, then that's the only way that you'll really find them is if you're really searching hard and they have their, that's on public or you're in the same general channel in a community already because the way that we're going to build these communities you know, as we grow is more so of a top-down approach where all communication is going to happen here, guys. Meaning we've got an entire email list. We're going to create the profiles for you. Just go in, update your profile, and then here's where we're going to chat. So like you'll be in the general chat and people can message you back and forth and you can block people just like you can on Facebook, but they're never going to have your location unless you accept their request or you request them to connect. So that way they're either general network or close network, right? Otherwise, they're never going to see anything that you do. They're not even going to be able to interact with you. And that's not, this isn't necessarily meant to be for people that you don't know. It's just to more maximize the relationships that you already have and potentially might be around and in certain communities that you just haven't connected the dots yet. That makes sense. And people won't have your exact location. It's not going to be like a freaking Uber where you're like, oh, you're five blocks away on your way to like our happy hour meetup. It, it's not that. They're just going to be like, she's in yep. Chicago. Exactly. Yeah. We, we don't even ask for your current location. It's just city only. And you can actually have multiple cities if you wanted to as of right now. So it's as public as or private as you want to be. Again, Right now, since I'm the founder, I have mine visible to everyone, but there's certain times where you can just go ghost mode and it's just more so this is to keep your itinerary there. And then you can actually go on your here and there map and see who's in town. So maybe you don't want to go there. You know what I mean? So that you can use it as that as well. Makes sense. All right. Well, where can people find out more if they have more questions about the app? Yeah, I mean, I would say that our website is a, is a great tool because depending on whether you're an android or an apple user or you just want to access from the desktop so it's thr-app.com that also has our instagram our linkedin facebook groups all within there as well as a, a pretty cool teaser video and then it'll have all of our updates and things to come and all of our partnerships that we're working on so i'm super excited about it and i appreciate your support obviously as well in this and this works worldwide, right? So if two people happen to be like in Turkey at the same time or in Singapore at the same time, and you can add contacts from all over the world. Correct. Yeah. And so right now it's for download in North America, but again, the web app, you can access anywhere in the world. So eventually every country will be available for download as well. But since we're startup, just starting in North America for downloading the native app. Makes sense. Well, thank you again, Eric, so much for coming onto the show today and sharing your app. And I hope a lot of people will try it out and be able to connect with each other in the real world as well, because that's where the magic happens with points and miles meetups. People are like, okay, what's like the secret website to go to, to learn all of the great points and miles tricks. And the answer is in the hallway, late at night of some conference. It's not a blog post that anybody can access. It's like at a bar at 3 a.m. And people are like, so fun, fun trick with point. That's where you get the good stuff. I mean, not only the good stuff, but man, I heard some great stories while I was there too. So <laughs> it's just very, very entertaining stories behind lots of travel always. So yeah, good times. And it's just bringing relationships back. I mean, back to in-person, bringing relationships back into business. Like it's just been missing for quite some time. So yeah, I appreciate you having me and thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards mentioned in today's episode piqued your interest, please check out the links in the show notes for more information on any of the cards. Also, if you apply for a card using the links on that page, I may receive a commission too, so please and thank you. 
P.S. I hear the links work better in Internet Explorer or Safari, and sometimes the credit card applications tend to glitch out in Chrome. Additionally, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast, leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. And if you would like to make even more travel hacking friends, please sign up for the Patreon to access our monthly masterclass hangouts. We dive deep into a particular points program each month, and you'll get to ask all of your travel hacking questions and enjoy being around other people who enjoy points and miles just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, head over to geobreeztravel.com hangouts to sign up to be on the invite list. Take care and happy travels.